Here's a nice thing you can do with conformal transformations. Say that, for example, you're dealing with a certain problem, differential equation, whatever, in a rather tricky coordinate system, a coordinate system which we're going to call x and y. Then the strategy might be to transform these coordinates into new coordinates. Let's call them u and v and use a conformal transformation for that. And then hopefully in this new coordinate system u and v, your uh, system of equations will become much easier to solve. So that's a certain strategy that we can uh, adopt here. You might say, okay, coordinate transformations by itself, that's nothing new, but you're going to see that we're really going to make use of the fact that we're dealing with complex numbers here and with holomorphic functions, because this x and this y, we're going to combine that into a complex number x plus jy, and then we're going to take our function to operate on that, give us a complex number w, um, which is then, of course, u plus jv. So this is the, the strategy. Now we're going to specifically use the Helmholtz equation as an example, the Helmholtz equation in media with piecewise constant refractive indices. So let's write that down. Let's say that our original coordinate system here uh, is x, y. So then we have the partial derivative of psi with respect to x twice. And then we also have that one with respect to y. Okay. And then we have the wave vector in vacuum, refractive index squared as a function of x and y and then our field psi as a function of x and y. Now, um, how can we transform that from an equation involving x and y into an equation involving u and v? So, so that's, that's the goal. So we basically want to derive something where we have a psi now expressed as u as a function of u and, uh, and v. Where, of course, u and v by themselves, they also depend on x and y. So basically, we have uh, the following here. So u, x, and y, v, x, and y. So our goal is to transform uh, this equation using all sorts of chain rules into an equation where we only have u's and v's and no longer x and uh, y's. Now we have a second order derivative here, but that's a bit too ambitious to do in one step. So let's first calculate the first order derivative, the psi dx, but rather express that um, as functions of partial derivatives with respect to u and partial derivatives with respect to v. So having a look at this particular relationship here, pause the video and see if you can apply the chain rule to express this expression here into something involving partial derivatives with respect to u and with respect to v. So that's of course the good old chain rule and if you want you can have a diagram which illustrates the dependencies. So in our current way of thinking here psi depends on the variables u and v but both u and both v they, they also depend again on x. So this is what we have and that can help us to write down the partial derivatives here because to calculate the psi dx we can first have the derivative of psi with respect to u and then of u with respect to x. So then we walk along this branch here and then if we walk along the second branch then we have the partial derivative of psi with respect to v plus dv dx here. Okay, so that's just the chain rule applied here. This might seem a little bit confusing because all of these dependencies here, so we start out from psi depending on x and y and then it depends on u and v but then u and v also depends on x and y so this seems a bit complicated so in order to perhaps help you to better understand what's going on let's uh, elaborate on this thing a little bit more hopefully with a concrete example that will help us clarify what's what's going on so if we have a function psi of x and y which is just simply going to be x and y as a starting point and then let's say we have a coordinate transformation, again a very trivial one, let's say that x is 2 times u and y is 2 times v, or 
u equivalently of course is x over 2 and v is y over 2. But then we can transform this equation, this psi, into uh, another psi where we just replace x and y by u and v. So x becomes uh, 2u and y becomes 2v. In this particular case, there's no longer an x and a y. This is actually a function of u and v. So these things are related, uh, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. So in order to sort of like underscore that difference between these two objects, we're just going to write a tilde above here, just to illustrate that psi and psi tilde are related through these equations. But fundamentally they're different because this is a function that depends on x and y, and this is a function that depends on u and v. Okay, now what we did up here was remembering again that u and v also depend back on x and y so if we try to do the same thing here what do we what do we get then we get yeah in essence and just to be on the safe side let's call it uh, yet another function psi uh, double tilde here where we really say that u depends on x and y and v also depends back on x and y so what we're doing in order to construct this function is to start from that template, that psi tilde, but everywhere we find the u, we replace it by its corresponding value expressed as a function of x and y, and the same thing for v. So we just start from uh, this thing over here, so we have two times u, and u is x over 2, and then we have two times v, and v is y over 2. That's, of course, x plus y, and that's exactly the same thing as our original function psi of x and y, which is not surprising because both this object and that object, they're fundamentally functions where the independent variables are x and y. So there's no need to distinguish this thing here with a double tilde. It's the same thing as our original function uh, back there. Okay, so now hopefully it becomes a little bit more concrete what we're doing with that uh, the chain rule because what we want to do now is calculate the the original derivative of our function and also the der derivative of psi double tilde which is the same with respect to x so if we calculate the psi double tilde with respect to x this thing should hopefully convince you that this is just the same as our original function with respect to x so the way we do that is with the chain rule. And the chain rule says that uh, first we need to calculate the derivative of uh, this function with respect to u. But obviously yeah, here there's no u here. The, the, the thing that's going on here. So if we go back to this, this diagram over here, we need to look at how they depend on u and v, right? So Therefore, the, the derivative with respect to u shouldn't happen at this level because there's no u here, but should happen at that level. So what we should do is calculate the derivative of that intermediate function, psi tilde, with respect to u, the psi tilde with respect to u, and then du dx, and then likewise the psi tilde with respect to v, dv dx. Now, in what we had up here, I was a little bit sloppy here. I didn't distinguish between the different variants of Psi, uh, but by writing it down explicitly once, hopefully things will be a bit clearer. And specifically, if we evaluate that using the concrete example that we have, if we calculate the Psi tilde du, that's going to give us 2. If we calculate du dx, that's going to give us 1 half. And then plus psi tilde with respect to v is also going to give us a 2. And then if we look at v as a function of x, well, there's no x, there's only a y, so this is 0. So that becomes, using the chain rule, we calculate that to be equal to 1. And you can indeed confirm that this is exactly the same as you would have when you were starting out with your original function without talking about uh, u and v. Our original function here, uh, where do we have it? Um, up there. So this function, x plus y, if we take the derivative with respect to x, that's also going to give us unity. 
So hopefully using this uh, more detailed explanation, you can really understand what's going on um, in terms of all of these complicated relationships of variables uh, depending on each other. Okay, good. So now that we have that under our belt, let's take stock of where we are. We calculated the first derivative of Psi with respect to X here. But what we need for our Helmholtz equation is to repeat that process one more time. So pause the video, take this complicated expression, and again, take the partial derivative with respect to X. Okay, let's copy that here again so that we can safely take the second order derivative. So what we were having was that the first derivative of Psi with respect to X is d Psi du du dx plus d Psi dv dv dx. Okay. And again, I'm not going to bother with all the, the tildes here, but you can keep at the back of your head what's, what's really going on here. Next step, let's calculate the second order derivative. So d psi dx squared. So we have two terms to worry about. Let's first start with this first term, which by itself is a factor consisting, uh, is a term consisting of two different factors. So what we need to do is first take the derivative with respect to x of the first, factor so this is going to be d psi du and then we keep the second factor intact and then we keep the first factor intact so that's d psi du and then we take the derivative with respect to x of the second factor so this is going to be dtu dx squared okay let's now do that for this uh, second term here so then we have the derivative with respect to x of d psi dv, okay? And then we have dv dx plus, and then we keep the first factor intact, so that's d psi dv, and then we take the derivative of the second factor, that's going to be partial derivative v with respect to x squared okay so this starts to look a bit more complicated but unfortunately it's going to get even more complicated because we still need to evaluate these terms here d dx of d psi du and d psi dv so let's focus on these to start with so let's have here the d dx of d psi du now this is exactly the same thing that's that's going on here as when we were calculating d dx of psi itself, making use of the fact that psi depended on u and v, and those again depend on x. So this is exactly the same as what we did here and 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 there. The, the only difference is that uh, so rather than having psi here, now we have psi replaced by d psi dx. But the same argument can be made, same relationships of variables with respect to each other and, and tilde is over here and chain rule. It's exactly the same thing here, um, but now with deep psi du rather than just psi. So in order to do that, we first uh, walk along this path and take the derivative with respect to u. So that's going to give us d2 psi du squared. And then du dx. And then we walk along the second path with respect to v. So that's going to give us second order derivative of psi du dv. So let's assume we can safely exchange the order here so the order doesn't really matter of u and v. Um, <clears throat> and then we have dv uh, dx finally. So dv x so this is how we calculate um, this this term over here and then exactly the same here that term just replacing u by v okay so now that we have this um, 
let's substitute these equations in there and then see what's uh, what's going on okay this is where it gets a little bit uh, hairy and uh, complicated not difficult but just a lot of terms to write down okay so let's just brace ourselves and do all of that work okay so we have the second order derivative of psi with respect to x we um, calculated that term here to be equal to that thing over there so let's just copy that square brackets here so we have d2 psi du squared du dx plus and then the mixed derivative u v d v d x okay and this uh, gets multiplied by du dx right and then we just copy and paste that final term there so this is going to give us the psi the u d 2 u d x squared okay and then we still need to do that for that uh, second uh, line here so that's just replacing uh, basically u by v so that's going to give us d2 psi d v squared dv dx plus and again we don't need to worry about whether we first take the derivative with respect to u and then with respect to v or the the, the other way around um so then we have here the u dx so just exchanging u and v here okay and then we have a d v dx and then the final term we copy is the following here e to v dx squared okay this was rather uh, painful let's take a deep breath and continue because we're only part way through our misery because we also need to calculate unfortunately um, the second order derivative with respect to y in order to calculate the uh, Laplacian. So that proceeds along exactly the same lines. The only thing that needs to happen is that we replace the x by y, but otherwise it's exactly the same. So let's see if I can sort of uh, copy and paste this and then do the changes manually. So hopefully that's going to be a little bit quicker. So copy and can I paste? Oh, takes a while. Paste. Okay. All right. There we have it. Which also draws my attention to the fact that this should obviously be a plus sign. Okay. Equal plus. And um, so now I should just replace everywhere I find an X with a Y. Okay, so the joys of E ink X with a Y, X with a Y, X, X, Y, Y, X, Y, and okay, Y. Right. So hopefully I didn't uh, screw up here. So now what we need to do is just add uh, these two monstrosities here to calculate the, the final Laplacian here. So the Laplacian x, y of psi is just the sum of uh, these two terms. So, um, so yeah, we need to bring some order into this chaos here and try and see if we can uh, identify terms which go uh, which go together okay there's uh, no other way than than forward so let's let's just do this and, and see what uh, what happens here right um so if you look here we have the psi du squared and we also have that there so let's uh, let's group 
these two things. So, and just in order to make sure that uh, we keep track of which terms that we've taken care of and which not, let's just put a dot there. So if we have these two terms, then uh, there are terms where we can factor out the psi u squared. And what we have then here is that these combine and then also those combine. So we have the square of the, uh, the UDX for the first term. And then we also have the square of the UDY. The UDY squared. Okay, cool. So um, that's already two terms taken care of. We have many more terms, unfortunately. Uh, let's focus on this term and that term. Now you see that they're basically the same and they're just in a slightly different order, uh, but, but we can, uh, can combine them. And uh, then, yeah, we basically just write that we have two times, and then we have the mixed derivative, the u, the v, and then we have the u, the x, the v, the x, the u, the x, the v, the x. Right. Okay, so that's two more terms. Let's now have a look at, uh, let's see the psi du here. So the psi du, we find that there and there. So if we have these two terms that we now focus on, then we have the psi du, and then we have the second order derivative of u with respect to x plus the second order derivative of u with respect to y. Okay, um, that's good. So we're halfway through. So that's, uh, that's good news. Let's congratulate ourselves and move forward. So now let's see what other factors we still need to worry about. So in the first line here, I have three dots. So I can just scroll that out of uh, view here. Let's now have a look at the psi dv squared, which we find here and which we find there. So we have d2 psi dv squared. Okay. And then what we have between brackets is going to be a square of dv dx and also dv dy. So dv dx squared plus dv dy squared. Okay, then we have these two terms, which are again the same. So we have two times the mixed derivative, d2 psi du dv. Okay, and then we have uh, the u dy, which appears, and also the v dy, which uh, appears. Okay, good. And then at long last, we have two, two more terms, the final terms. And uh, there we have these guys left here, which both contain a deep psi dv. And then what we have inside is the v dx squared plus dv dy squared. Okay, that was extremely painful, but uh, we've done it, I think. So we have now collected all of these, uh, these terms and hopefully um, didn't make any mistake because now the fun part starts. Now we can really start to make use of the fact that we're dealing with a holomorphic function and then we can get rid of lots of terms here, which is always uh, great, great fun. So remember the cauchy riemann conditions, they tell us that we have the udx equal to dv dy and du dy equal to minus dv dx. So um, if we do that, let's first focus our attention on these guys. And then you see if we replace, for example, the u dx with dv dy, so the u dx becomes the same as dv dy. But if you look at the remaining terms, 
and we have the v dx that becomes minus the u dy. So the good news is that these guys cancel. So that's already a big simplification, thanks to Koshi Riemann. And there's another simplification because there's an exercise where we've shown that if you have a holomorphic function and if you calculate the Laplacians of the real parts and the imaginary parts, that these guys are zero as well. And lo and behold, these Laplacians, you find them here and you also find them there. So luckily, uh, these cancel as well. And then we only have uh, two terms left here. There's some minor annoyance in the fact that you have these terms here between square brackets. So perhaps pause the video and think about what's really going on with these terms in square brackets and see if you can simplify things. And then finally write down the uh, transformed equation. Okay, we're in the home stretch here. Let's um, have a look at what we had up here. So we had the um, du dx squared plus du dy squared. So let's let's copy that and then use Cauchy Riemann. So we have du sorry du dx huh, du dx squared plus du dy squared. Let's double check the u dx squared plus the u dy squared. Let's apply Cauchy Riemann. So the u dx, uh, that's dv dy. So this now becomes dv dy squared. And then the u dy, that becomes minus dv dx. But if we square, uh, that doesn't really matter. But the u dy is going to give us a dv dx squared. Now, if we compare uh, that expression to that expression over here, we can luckily uh, come to the conclusion that these are exactly the same. So we can also factor these, uh, these things out. And actually, just for cosmetic reasons, what we're going to do is not choose this one to represent that expression between brackets or that one, uh, but just make a single substitution here so that we have du dx squared. And then we only replace that term, so the u dy, um, that becomes uh, minus the v dx, so that we only have partial derivatives with respect to x there. Okay. And uh, since this thing appears twice, we're going to give this a special name. So we're going to call this 1 over t squared just to make it a little bit more simple to write down. And then don't forget, of course, this t here, uh, since we're taking deriv the derivatives with respect to, to x and to y, this is going to be a function of, of x and y. But also don't forget then again that these x and y's, they also depend again on u and, and v uh, as, uh, as before. Okay, so now that we have this, we can just wrap everything up and combine everything in a single equation. Um, if we start from our original Helmholtz equation, we've calculated the Laplacian using u's and v's. So that gives us 1 over uh, t squared of u and v. Of, uh, and then we have the second order derivative of psi. And there's only u's and v's inside now with respect to u and with respect to v. So that's what we had uh, up there, of course. So these were the terms where we only had derivatives of psi with respect to u's and v's. Strictly speaking, it's psi tilde because uh, what we've explained before, but let's not make things overly heavy on the notation. And uh, then, of course, we have our final term, k naught squared, n squared, which we can also write as a function of u and v, of course, times psi of u and v is equal to zero. Or if you just want to bring that t to that second uh, term here, so then we have the transverse. Well, let me just to make sure that there's no doubt. 
be explicit here, the u squared plus d2 psi u v d v squared plus k naught squared n squared u v t squared u v psi u v equal to zero. So the end result of our very long and complicated calculation is that if we start from the Helmholtz equation as a function of x and y, and we apply the coordinate transformation given by the conformal transformation, we end up with something that suspiciously looks like another Helmholtz equation. So it's, it's formally identical. So we have a Laplacian here, and then we have another term that looks very similar. The only thing that has happened is that we went from a refractive index, uh, an original refractive index in the xy domain, to a new refractive index, which is the same refractive index expressed as UNV, of course, but then multiplied by this T. So we might gain in terms of going from a complicated coordinate system to a simple coordinate system, but the price we pay for that is that we change our refractive index profile from perhaps a simple refractive index profile to perhaps a more complicated refractive index profile. Um, but this is something that's actually useful in a number of cases, and we will be looking at one of these cases in a next uh, video.